Okay. So what I'm going to do here to make this kind of fun, uh, we're going to switch back and forth uh, to some artwork that I'm going to be working on today. Uh, and uh, this artwork features uh, the Vaquita, of course. And uh, I'm going to be preparing a digital painting this time. So last two times we did sort of a live traditional drawing or an acrylic painting. So that was a lot of fun. This time I brought my other uh, side of my studio and we're going to be doing a digital painting of Vaquita in full color. So it should be kind of fun that way. And if you want to follow along, uh, that's great. You can also use this to view it afterwards if we record it. Um, uh, as an example of how I do this and uh, gives you sort of like a, a, a view of what it's like to be uh, a digital artist this way as well. So it's very similar actually to working on things like acrylic, but this way I get to do it right in the computer. So I guess um, uh, Marcus will control the the c cameras and stuff and whatever you want to switch back and forth between the um, the painting and, uh, you know, a screenshot of my face or whatever. But I think most people would be interested in the painting especially. <laughs> so, okay, so what I've got here is you can see I have this, this sort of studio set up where I have, uh, this is an interactive LCD display. Um, and I can use a stylus uh, to paint right on the screen. And then I've got a little remote that I can use to zoom in and out as well. So for example, if I want to look closer, I can do that or zoom out. Um, it's really a handy little device and I use this for my work in general. Now to, uh, you've already seen some wonderful photos of the Vaquita and other purposes from Tom. Uh, here is one that I have painted for the Porpoise Conservation Society. So this is an example of uh, Vaquita artwork that I've done. Uh, it gives you sort of an idea of what this looks like in ways that we generally do not are not able to see it when when those of us who are able who are lucky enough to be out in the field to see it are able to see it because most of the time all you see is the, <laughs> the fin maybe right uh, from above the water and as Tom was saying they're very secretive they tend not to show themselves too much they don't leap from the water so what we're seeing here is what you would be able to see if you were so lucky that you were underwater when they passed by basically and they have several really neat little features uh, porpoises are really fascinating because, and here's a, a view of all, certainly, currently all known uh, species of porpoise on Earth, uh, all to scale, basically. The vaquita is the smallest. It's a little tiny one. It's barely, it's about the size of your two outstretched arms. Really tiny for cetacean. Uh, the other ones uh, are, occur in different parts of the world. So this one has the most restricted range. And if you live near the ocean, chances are you'll be able to potentially see some sort of porpoise uh, in various parts of the world. But today, we're focusing mostly on, on the Vaquita. Um, the neat thing about porpoises, I just go back to that artwork as well there, uh, is that you can see, if you look at the dorsal fin, the, the fin on the back, whether it's present or not, there's a finless one, they're very different from each other. That's something that, that is really useful in identifying porpoises. You can see that they vary from no dorsal fin uh, to a, uh, a kind of a swept back one in Burmeisters. A uh, very sort of a, a low triangular one, like in our harbor porpoise here, to really weird, long, plate-like one, like in the spectacled porpoise in the male. And the vaquita, oh, it's a, the Dallas porpoise has a weird um, forward swept one in, in, in uh, larger, uh, especially the male individuals. And the vaquita is the one that has the most dolphin-like fin. And so Lauren was going, I uh, was explaining how the podcast that uh, the PCS runs, the uh, Orbit's Conservation Society runs, the Not a Dolphin, uh, the, the Vaquita sort of ironically is the most dolphin looking of the porpoises, <laughs> I guess you could say. If you don't look at its snout, the, the, it doesn't have a long rostrum like most dolphins do. Some more have short ones like this, but its dorsal fin, for example, is very dolphin-like. So anyway, sort of an overview of the various porpoises there. And this is the, the Vaquita porpoise that we're gonna be uh, dealing with today. And I'm gonna be painting a picture of a Vaquita porpoise uh, in its environment. So I've kind of started out a little bit with painting uh, some of the background. Now, if you want to do this, one of the things to keep in mind is when you're doing nice backgrounds, you want to make it sort of like lively and, 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 and diverse. So you don't want to make it too uniform. Have fun with, uh, you know, throwing paint around and such and changing colors and such. For me, when I'm doing this, I can change colors by selecting different colors in my color picker here. Uh, I can also use a color picker to select an existing color from there. So what you see here is mostly what I've set up in the background. I always usually do that. I kind of give a, a, a background color first and then I can start on the actual subject. 
and the subject in this case will be our cute little panda of the sea, the vaquita. So what I'm going to do is, for me, I get to set up a new layer. This is something where it's kind of nice to have digital artwork um, because I can set up an entire new, new layer uh, called vaquita. And that way I can separate the work on that layer uh, oops, from the previous layers. So I'm just going to set up an There we go. That's so cool. And this way, if I make an error on it, I want to change it. I only have to change that one layer. All It's like all the paint underneath it has dried and I'm working on a whole new layer of like cellophane or whatever. Um, although not cellophane, we don't like cellophane, it's, it's plastic and we, we don't want to use disposable single-use cellophane if we can avoid it, right? There are good alternatives to that because that's one of the things that's uh, um, cramming up the oceans and that a lot of animals like sea turtles will mistake it for jellyfish and choke on it, unfortunately. So yeah, uh, let's say just a kind of a film. And so now I'm working on a whole other layer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start painting a vaquita. Now a vaquita are neat little guys to paint here. I'm going to use my other artwork here is kind of, oops, not that one. It's kind of a little bit of a, a mini guide um, just because, you know, it's, as a scientific illustrator, it's important for me to get the anatomy right. So I've used photographs of them to get this right. And this piece that I've done here is one that I've painstakingly taken care to make sure that all of it is right. You'll see certain features like it has that, that cute little uh, ring around its eye that dark spot there. This is one of the reasons why it's it's referred to sort of colloquially as the panda of the sea. It kind of has this little eye spot. It's really adorable. They've also got this little dark area around the mouth. And then there's these little lines coming from the back of the mouth or under the mouth to the pectoral fins or the flippers, these two which are equivalent to our arms. And then of course there's a little bit of a, a grayish wash and there's a darker back. And so the, the eye, the dark eye with the lighter ring around it is kind of very characteristic of the vaquita specifically. And that's something that, um, that is really easy to identify them from. Uh, so what I'm going to do to make things interesting, this vaquita that I'm painting here, I'm just going to adjust the brush a little bit, um, is going to be sort of kind of swimming a little bit toward us. Uh, and it's passing close by us. So imagine we're underwater. And we're just hanging out there in the Sea of Cortez. And all of a sudden, this beautiful little uh, fish-sized, like Tatuaba-sized animal swims past us. And of course, that's why they're in such great danger, is that the, the gill nets that are designed to catch the Tatuaba fish um, for, that, they're, that are poached for the swim bladders, uh, the doll, they, they're designed to catch something about the same size as a vaquita. And so, of course, the vaquita is also likely to get entangled in those same nets. So I'm going to start painting here. You can see uh, I'm setting up sort of basically a, a block of color, roughly the shape of a, of a vaquita, and then I'll, I'll refine it as I go. This is going to be sort of like the front end, the head of the animal. And then toward the back here, what you're going to see is that as it's swimming close to us, that part is going to be a little bit larger than the back part because what we have is we're dealing with perspective. And it's also, so anything that's closer to you appears a little bit larger than it, proportionally to the rest of it than, than it is if, it's looking, if you're looking at it from the side. Also, the animal looks a little squat and shorter because of this thing called foreshortening, which right, means that if you look at something edge on, um, you don't, it doesn't seem, it seems to shrink in size because of course it, yeah, it, it, most of it is, is going into the page in this case. So here's our general large first block that defines where the vaquita is going to be on the page. And then I'm going to start to add larger pieces to it like the dorsal fin. This doesn't have to be like perfect right away. And this, if you're doing this by painting, let's say with acrylic paints, those are fun to work with because they dry quickly. You can, you can paint over them easily. You know, they're very amenable to changes, to, to uh, fixing and such. But one thing I've learned as an artist working with acrylic paints, which as you know, are kind of plastic based. And right today, the, the big message is about trying to find ways to avoid uh, harming marine life using, you know, by our footprint in various ways. And one of the ways we do, we harm them, unfortunately, is by throwing away single use plastics uh, like bags and such. And so uh, acrylic paint is kind of plastic based, right? So if you wash out your brush and then you rinse that washings down the sink, 
you've generated a bunch of little like microplastic pieces, which are really nasty. So what I do instead of, if I'm using acrylic paints, is I will collect all of the brush washings in a larger container. Uh, instead of throwing it down the sink and I just let it dry out. Just set it on the counter in the sun or wherever and just dries out over time. And then all that happens is that acrylic forms layer on the bottom of that container and I just keep using that container over and over and over again to put more washings in it and dry it out. And all that happens is you collect all of that waste in one place instead of washing it down. Anyway, that's something that I found as an artist that is is maybe a, a more sustainable way to use uh, an otherwise sort of plastic-based paint so that you can do that as well. So you can see now here that the Vaquita is sort of taking shape. I've been adding a little bit of darkness to it. And now we're heading toward the back here toward the flippers or sorry, the flukes, the flukes and all these names for the different parts of animals. So with cetaceans, with uh, marine mammals that um, that are related to whales, uh, they have the they have fins that are that have evolved completely independently of those of fish in some cases. The dorsal fin and the flukes in the back have evolved completely independently. Uh, the flippers, the two in the front there, are what we call homologous to the front pectoral fins of fish. In other words, they have the same genetic origin. They, they, they both uh, are the same, the same structure that is our arms and the pectoral fin of fish. And in cetaceans, whales and dolphins and porpoises, they evolved back into flippers, into fin-like structures. Uh, but the flukes in the back here, these little, the tail fin and the dorsal fin evolved completely brand new after the ancestor of cetaceans entered the water. And these have evolved uh, because they make the animal much more able to swim through the water more efficiently uh, to control itself underwater um, and use less energy as a result. So there are the flukes in the back. And so this vaquita you can see is kind of coming toward us again. So you get the foreshortening. The flukes are kind of pointing downwards. So it's kind of in the middle of a, a stroke, of a beating a stroke with its tail. And then of course you have the flippers in the front. Now those are close to the front here. So they're gonna be a little bit larger proportionally than we have in the drawing that is sort of as a guide. They're coming out of the side a little bit. And because this vaquita is kind of facing us, we're gonna see both of those flippers, uh, one on each side of the animal. So I kind of have to imagine where the other one would come out. So I kind of, what I do is I draw an imaginary sort of cross-sectional shape for the vaquita, kind of oval, right at the point where the, the flipper connects on our side. And then where that meets on the other side is where I would normally start the other flipper. And it comes out like this kind of, it's kind of a little shortcut to figuring out where to put your fins on an animal uh, if you're looking at it and you can't see the origin of the fin on the other side, it kind of helps you to kind of do it sort of in an imaginary way or in your head, so to speak. So here we go. They've got parts of the vaquita. And of course, the nice thing is this stylus also has a built-in eraser function on the back. So again, different from, <laughs> from acrylic paint. I can't just erase acrylic paint easily. You can pull it off with water if you do it fast enough. But I, I've got a shortcut here with, with this digital artwork. So that makes it a whole lot nicer. Now, Julius, is that a bit easier for you to make any uh, corrections because you have those layers, like you said? You've Absolutely. kept the base separate from what you're currently doing? For sure. So I can just turn this off if I want. It's still there. It's just turned off now, and then I can turn it back on. If I want to see what's behind it, if I want to work on the background and just switch layers and do that, uh, when I erase here, I'm just erasing the one layer. So it doesn't do anything to the, the background. So if I, I can erase out a chunk like that, you can still <gasps> see the background. That's okay because I also have a, a, a back step function. Oh. <laughs> so I can just, and that's one other undo. thing we can't do undo with, with traditional artwork. Just, I, and the funny thing is, and a lot of artists will, will agree with me on this, is that when we switch to, to traditional artwork, like uh, drawing with a pencil or with acrylic paint, I have this, um, this desire sometimes to hit undo when I've made a mistake and then I realize, Oh, wait, I'm not doing this digitally. I can't undo. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do those kind of things. And yes, I have almost uh, put my stylus into 
uh, a, a a mug of coffee. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> I didn't, but it was close. <laughs> uh, and yes, I have dipped my traditional brush into my coffee because I accidentally <laughs> mistook it for the washing water. So yeah, a lot of artists will have these kind of stories. Uh, we get so focused on what we're doing. <laughs> totally, totally. So one of the things that I want to kind of switch to while I'm doing this, and Lauren and Marcus, we can chat about this, is what can you do to make a difference for the vaquita? And this is, I think it's kind of a fun time to talk about it as I do this. So you can watch as I paint, but we can also talk about the things that we do that can make a difference. Now, we're talking about this now, especially, or at least in, in the, now as well in this segment, because artwork is such a useful um, tool for advocating for conservation. I've been able to apply it to so many in so many ways. Uh, one popular way is um, you've seen us do a version of this before as well on, on the International Save the Vaquita Day. It's kind of a drawing workshop where you can tune in and, and learn how to draw. I'm basically doing the same thing here. It's just that right now I'm getting less direct um, instruction on the drawing, less kind of a step-by-step -step sort of thing. But I do that for several different organizations online, and then we kind of teach kids and adults about these fascinating and endangered species, and also teach them the fun thing of how to draw them at the same time. So that's one way. Another way, and this is one that you'll be able to use over and over again, and that is really pertinent today, is that you can create these drawings and then send them in emails or physical letters, maybe even better, to those government representatives, uh, either locally in your area or to, in this case, for example, the Mexican government or the Canadian federal government or the U.S. federal government, uh, key people there that are going to be important in making decisions or influencing others in, in meetings internationally to make policy decisions that will help the vaquita. So making stronger laws to prevent poaching, for example. That's a big one. That's what we need the Mexican government to do, especially and to enforce those. So, for example, you could write a letter to somebody at the Mexican embassy, for example, in your city um, or or even visit them uh, and encourage them to make, you know, to, to have the right kind of influence, to, to encourage the Mexican government to make these kinds of changes. But one of the things we can do, regardless of whether we're able to move around or not, is we can send letters. And so one of the things that I found to be a kind of a neat Thing to consider is to send a picture with your letter and um, you know you can maybe draw a little sketch even on your envelope but especially inside because it's going to be harder for them to just kind of toss it away if there's this really nice little picture that they get to keep as well and I think it's going to make a stronger impression of, on them if there's also some uh, a, a beautiful picture that you've taken time to create to show your appreciation and concern for these animals and to show what you love about them. Um, Put your heart into it, you know, make a make a beautiful colored picture or, or a beautiful drawing, whichever. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you don't have a lot of skill or experience with it. The point of this is that it, your love for it will show through. Anybody will, will be able to see that anyway. So put your heart into it. Use your artwork to help advocate to save a species. And this is an, actually an opportunity for us to do this because as, as others have said, the vaquita is actually, even though there are only, like Tom was saying, maybe 10 of them around, it sounds impossible. But it's, it, it appears from research that even these small numbers, they're able to recover from these small numbers if they're given a chance and they don't have to encounter these nets that can kill them. So, yes, we can make a difference. It is not too late. It is a reasonable thing to do. The other thing to consider is that regardless, we want to take a stand... And we want to keep telling uh, government representatives that we stand up against poaching, period. We want these kinds of poaching cartels, especially these organized ones, to stop. And regardless of how well the vaquita does, we want to make sure we protect everything, all life in the Sea of Cortez and elsewhere, that is now unfortunately very subject to poaching. And so we should be doing this anyway, whether we... How, whatever we think of in terms of how likely it is that the vikiti will survive, I really hope they will. I do. I'm realistic. I know that there's a chance that we might lose the battle, but I don't want to focus on that. What I want to focus on is, you know what? I'm going to take the stand. 
We want to say this far, no further. We stand up against poaching. And the way to do that effectively is to reach those people who make the laws and enforce them. Because individually, you know, we can't go out there and, and physically stop them, but we can empower people who do have the means to do that. Um, and this is what we need to do. So here we go. We've got the Vikita kind of coming along here. Um, and anyway, yeah, you guys just please interject anytime. <laughs> I know I tend to ramble, but please do. I, I do not mind being cut off, but I have this tendency to ramble. Hey, you know, I'm the same. <laughs> I, I, everything you're saying is, is on point with what I'm thinking as well. And, you know, you were mentioning about, and we've talked about this in the podcast and, and anyone watching, I know there's about 200 people uh, watching right now from, from all over. Um, we know that that poaching, as as Julius just mentioned, is a huge uh, concern. And I also think it's important for us to remember that the reason there's poaching out there is there's demand, right? right? And I remember having a conversation with someone years ago about, you know, consuming a species that was highly endangered. And the conversation kind of went to, well, I'm going to eat it as long as I can. And I don't know if I said that last year as well. It's it the just you know <laughs> yeah, and it's it's one of those things where some of us you know might have that mindset and others don't. Um, so I think you know for us as people who care and are concerned about this species, and again as as Julius mentioned, it's not just this species; it's a lot. Um, sometimes even those little conversations, maybe you're out with someone who yes. is talking about how uh, they can't wait to try Totoaba, maybe they're going on vacation or whatever. Um, and then having that awkward conversation of saying like, oh, you know, that's a really endangered species and there's, there's a lot of problems. We have so much power to affect change in so many ways. Julius is giving us a list of of, you know, using art and writing letters, 100%, that's incredibly effective. But I'm actually curious, I wanted to kind of turn it on our on our viewers, anyone who's currently watching, uh, or if you're watching this at a later time, um, what have you done? What kind of ways have you tried to affect change? Maybe you were asking someone at the grocery store if that was a sustainable seafood. Maybe you um, created a program at your school. Uh, we had a bunch of students at the school yeah. I was working at, and they they recreated the recycling program at the high school. And the power of these students was was unbelievable. That's so wonderful. I'm curious about any of our viewers. What kind of things have you done to affect a change? Maybe there's something you've done to help Vikita specifically. Um, maybe there's something that you've done to protect you know, old growth forests or protecting the oceans, or you're involved with an organization that's taking plastic out of the sea, whatever it is. I'm kind of curious, um, what, what else is out there? Cause you, you know, it's a, it's an unbelievably complex list of things that we can do. And I think when you have such a big list of things that you can do, Julius and I were talking about this earlier, that it does feel like there's not much that we can do, but the list of what we can do is so huge that we have Absolutely. we do have the power. Absolutely. So we'll keep an eye on those questions. And that's the thing. It's a very good point, Lauren. Is that not just it's not just about you know sending letters to government representatives, but yeah, let's reach out to our friends. Mm -hmm. And um, and 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 as you're saying, uh, yes, it's very easy for us to feel overwhelmed and discouraged and and to feel despair that well, what we, what we're doing isn't is, a, is less than a drop in the bucket, but remember that individuals who are motivated can make a big difference. Uh, yep. I mean, I always think back uh, as, as one extreme example, but very true. Uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, just a few years ago, uh, started something that is massive now. And it's one person. Yep. Uh, but that, that you don't even need one person who's made that big a difference. You need to make just a tiny difference. If you influence your friends, just let them know about this, as, as Tom was saying, and as, as Marcus and, and Lauren were saying, very few people actually even know what a vaquita is. We need to know that before we can make uh, enough of a difference to help them in many cases. So just spread the word, uh, find ways, organize, yes, with your school, uh, you know, workshops or, or meetings or clubs to uh, help um, wildlife in your area or, or remotely with the vaquita. So many wonderful things you can do, either with using artwork or without. Um, you know, go make signs and stand in front of, you know, like your local government representative place to say, you know, signs that say that you love the vaquita, that you want them preserved, and here's what you can do. Contact people like that. Um, 
the key is we want to do things in a, in a, a peaceful way, but there's so many things we can do this way. So many ways to get involved. Uh, you can organize, you know, with your with groups. You can you can. Um, I think few people know this. Well, maybe a lot of people know this, but not everybody does. That you can organize, depending on where you are, meetings either in person or or virtually now. Meetings with your uh, government representatives uh, in your constituency to talk about certain topics that you're concerned about, and it's that's what they're there to do to hear you. That's why you have local representatives, as they need to hear what their constituents want. And they don't know what they want, what we want, unless we tell them. So uh, I encourage you, and we're going to put together a package. Um, I, uh, I like it. They, they, they don't know what we want. Right? Yeah. Exactly. That's it. And, and, and we need to tell them this. Because, and we found this out as well, meeting with, with our local representative several times. Uh, he was unaware of some of the problems that we had brought up. And it's, we are educating them. They, it's super important because a lot of them will sh will shift between different ministries. And so they have to learn a lot. They're not going to learn a lot of this stuff automatically. We need to tell them repeatedly sometimes. And so when we do that, they are now aware of the issue and can start acting on it. Um, so look up and we're going to put together a little package uh, on how to find out, you know, who your local representatives are to meet with, for example. And then you can, and there are going to be little there's, uh, links also to great websites that help you to prepare for meetings. So what you can, you know, how you, how it's best to approach them, what's best in terms of length of time or what to say that's most effective, things like that, uh, either in letters or meeting in person. Uh, and these are all super effective. And, and I have found with several of our groups that this is, in fact, quite effective locally here. And um, we can affect things over a much greater range nowadays, too. And the more people you get together in these meetings, the more impactful the meetings will be on those people. So that's uh, government. There's also potential for meeting with industry. Um, and we're seeing some of that here and there as well. So whatever opportunity you have to encourage people who make decisions or who, you know, who um, are involved in industries that, that affect wildlife such as the vaquita, please do. You may naturally feel uh, apprehensive at first or nervous meeting with them. I did it at first too. But you know what? It, it takes very little time to get over that. And you'll see that they're actually very courteous when you meet with them typically. Uh, it's their job to be respectful and responsive to people. Uh, and so you're going to find that it, it's a lot better experience than you, you fear it is. Uh, and it, it, it's super fun once you get to the point where you see that, you know, you, oh, I, I just let them know about something they didn't know about. And, and, and that maybe now they can, they can take this a step further and actually make big change in policy as well. So anyway, that's, so I go back here to, to the policy making because really that's a very big important thing for the Vaquita today. No, but, for sure. And I, I think you made a really interesting point of, you know, they don't know unless you tell them. And I think no matter what in anyone's life, I think we all probably have experienced this where you, you get really, you know, down the rabbit hole on, on something. Mm -hmm. And in your head, you're like, surely everyone knows this. But when you start having conversations, you realize not as many people know about this thing as you expect that they would. Um, so just even having that respectful conversation or, or asking that question in the first place is a good way to kind of just get a sense of where people are at. And, and it's not often that people are trying to be purposefully, um, like not understanding something like they're purposely trying to ignore something like they, people have a lot of stuff going on in yeah. their lives. Like these last couple of years have been a little intense for everyone. Oh, wow. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh wow. And everyone, yes. everyone's got stuff going on. Not everyone knows everything, so we can be a bit more um, gentle when we when we have those conversations and bring people along with us. It's a lot easier to um, get people involved when we are a bit more gentle instead of yes. <laughs> attacking them with our you know our frustrations. So, I I, I agree with you, Julius. Like having those um, letter campaigns, like they are effective. They yes, they, they absolutely are. make a difference. So 100% write your ideas down draw your art, share that. And, and this is something that's accessible to everyone and anyone. Um, we want to make sure as many people and can be a part of this. It doesn't need to be perfect. Like, yeah, um, exactly. I'm Marcus, by the way, the voice in, in, the, in the distance. <laughs> I'm the only one who doesn't have a camera here. 
But uh, <laughs> everyone who's been watching Julius and has been thinking like, oh my God, I'm never, never going to pull off anything like this to, to include in my letter to the Mexican government. Well, uh, I assure you the Mexican president probably can't paint better than you. So <laughs> just give it a go. I make, I make mean stick poppers. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the th <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> yes, exactly. Actually, one of the neat things would be I don't know um, if we've set up anything, but it'd be really neat to see people's artwork as well. If 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 there was a way for us to have people submit it and make even a little gallery or something for the event, yeah. I know that'd be really cool. Uh, we'll have to think about how to do that. But but we've done that with several of our several of the how to draw sessions I've done with various organizations, uh, and it's really neat to see people's artwork submitted and then you can kind of look through it and see what other people have done as a result of this i think it'd be really cool for us to see your artwork if you're if you're willing to send it um your, your, this, your yeah. stick vaquita are most welcome um, absolutely you can share it absolutely. with with hashtag um save the vaquita just one word save the vaquita uh, we're going to be monitoring this on instagram so if you're on instagram and i hope you are for this purpose uh, please show your artwork and We'd love uh, to see it Tell you what, I'll draw something on my phone. That's all I have. I'm hey, going to draw. Cool. I'll, I'll attempt to draw a stick porpoise and I will post it. And you know, that's the other thing that there are many free um, software packages for phones and iPads and various things like that that allow you to draw with your finger even or, you know, even if you don't have a stylus and you can just do quick, easy digital artwork that way. Um, a lot of people haven't tried this before, but there are some things out there that you can get. And it's a lot of fun to do that as well. Um, especially if you just kind of wanted to do a sketch. A um, great way to do it digitally. But yeah, I mean, the other way, of course, is traditionally pick up a pen and paper. Um, right now, that I've got this set up as an eight and a half by 11 inch um, page here. I usually do that for my drawing webinars anyway, because a lot of people have letter size paper available. Uh, unless, of course, you're you know overseas and then you have a different system in many cases. Uh, and I was just thinking, Julius, maybe we should. I'm not sure if you're willing to do this because uh, Julius is an award winning artist um, <laughs> with a PhD in microbiology. Um, probably the smartest person in the room here right now. No. <laughs> At least I always feel that way when I'm with Julius. Uh, but, Julius, are you going to make this available oh, yeah. for people to download? Oh, sure, um, maybe sure, they can sure, just sure, sure. print it and put yeah. that into their letters. That's if, the other thing. I mean, it's better if you do your own, I think, because That's I think the point of it is to personalize it. But um, but absolutely, you can use it for if you wanted it to, you know, to to share it online or whatever in messages, posts or whatever. Please feel free. Um, and uh, absolutely, I'll make it available. So we'll we'll have a package of various kinds of things afterwards as well, like, you know, how to reach. Uh, how to write letters and such, or you know, like, uh, websites that show you uh, maybe how to find your representatives or whatever, um, and um, and this will include as well as like the the image, the completed image or the close to completed image <laughs> sort of thing. This is kind of like a painting sketch, by the way. This is kind of um, it's how I would kind of begin a lot of my pieces anyway. Uh, if I were doing this for a, a client, for let's say a research publication, it would take a lot longer to finish it up. And this is very, very rough at this stage, but um, compared to what I would do for those kinds of um, uh, purposes, <laughs> this purpose, this purpose. <laughs> but uh, uh. sorry, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but this is how it begins basically, um, and uh, and as we go, actually, as I'll, I'll mention a couple of other neat things about this this process here is that uh, one of the things we can do uh, is when we when we create oops, when we create these these artworks uh, of of organisms underwater these these wonderful life forms underwater um, if it's near the surface and if the water is fairly clear then you get these wonderful patterns on their backs um, called caustics uh, caustics are a result of sunlight passing from the air into the water and then being refracted by the, uh, by the water. And the light is basically bent in different directions as a result of passing through this, um, this interface between two different media. And as a result, it's focused in different ways. And then some places you have a highly focused beam of, of sunlight appearing and then very darker areas in between. The end result, and I'll make a new layer for this actually, there's so much technique that oh, I, I, that I, I can't it. that I can't it's reproduce fun. with my stick bucket. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how quickly uh, one can learn this. It's super fast uh, if if you put a little of effort into it and um, and you know 
get the right kind of instruction. It, it, people can pick this up incredibly fast. It's amazing, really. But what we're going to do here is uh, I'll show you what the caustics kind of look like when I paint them on. A couple of couple of tips if you're doing underwater artwork. Uh, not painting underwater. I mean, maybe you could do that too, which would be fun if you had the right media. But painting pictures of scenes from underwater. Uh, the caustics would work something like this. I'm going to select a brighter, higher, uh, brighter thing. So now we're on a different layer here again. So if I erase the caustics, I wouldn't erase my vaquita. The caustics appear as now they, they are controlled by the the direction of waves, right? Waves change the angle of the surface of the water and therefore the way that the sunlight is bent when it enters. And you get areas where it's focused and areas where it's not. And the end result is you get this network pattern, this bending network pattern of bright lines on the back of the porpoise. And uh, they intersect with each other. And when they intersect, they get brighter because it's basically light adding to light, which makes it brighter in those places where they intersect. Uh, basically a series of lines and twisty lines and such. And then, and then you gotta remember that this is on the curved back of an animal, okay? So the light is coming almost straight down so that the sides of the animal will not get those caustics. But as we near the side, the caustics get stretched out because it's now hitting an angle and you're seeing it in a very different way. So as you go toward the sides of the animal, these caustic lines will get dimmer, but more stretched out vertically. So this is natural. So you can't just paint them the same network way all around. If you wanna do it accurately, you make them sharpest on top, and then more stretched out and fading on the sides. And on the sides, they end with basically a series of these kind of vertical lines as the caustics kind of bleed off into sort of an infinity of the deep. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to do caustics. And then again, you have these brighter points where they intersect, because again, basically a bunch of lines that are focused sunlight um, by the waves above. And if there's no wave movement at all, if it's completely calm, you won't get these caustics, right? because there's, there's no focusing happening. There's no uh, differential distribution of sunlight. It's all beautifully smoothly passing down. All you'll have is a bright upper surface to the vaquita. If it's really, really wavy, then you also often don't get caustics because now there's so much movement and so many different directions the light is passing that everything gets kind of muddled together. You don't get these beautiful sharp caustics. It's only an intermediately disturbed water um, slight waves that you get these brightest, sharpest caustics. Um, and we're pretending that's the case now. It's like one of those beautiful Beaufort, um, is it Beaufort one? Yeah. Seas that Tom was describing that, that are best for, whoops, for seeing vaquita. Uh, so we're showing well, uh, Beauf a vaquita. Beaufort zero. Oh, sorry, Beaufort, Beaufort zero. Best, right, right. That's the calm. Uh, or very close to it anyway. Very close Be to Beaufort it. Beaufort one is just a few ripples. So maybe the water. like that. Yeah. So we're close to the time, you know, close to conditions that would be optimal for seeing vaquita on the surface. Uh, a little bit more waves. You really don't need much waves to set up caustics, just a tiny, tiny bit. So probably close to Beaufort zero. Uh, and then here, when you get to the dorsal fin, remember that they're narrow, right? It's like, a, it's like I'm holding my hand basically like that. So you'll only get caustics show up clearly if the, if the porpoise is, is vertically oriented in the water so that the dorsal fin is vertical, you only get caustics show up really brightly on the edge, on the leading edge of it, right? Uh, and then the lines come down the side very sharply because uh, that's like the side of the animal, the way it's oriented. So, and you can even, you know, like erase out parts of it. I'm, I'm gonna change my eraser to make it less opaque so I can erase out part of it. This is again, kind of fun because it's like erasing lightly, right? If it was a real eraser. Um, and so we get little caustics here and there. And, and keep in mind, you don't want to make them too regular either. It's one of the things that it's very hard to master an artist to, to make things look natural. You need sort of a uh, less regularity than you might feel is, is, is required. Uh, you don't have, like the, the waves on the surface aren't a perfect geometric pattern of, of squares, for example, right? Or, or, or single lines. So rarely do you get such simple looking waves like this, just a single line of waves and nothing else. Usually they're all over the place. And so you, the caustics reflect this. Um, no pun intended in this case, refracted, I guess would be accurate that way. But uh, they, they reflect it in the sense that, that they're also sort of helter skelter all over the place and they move <laughs> fast. And so you're trying to capture a moment in this dynamic play, this dance of light on the back of an animal. Uh, and so, you know, whatever 
you know, there's a lot of right answers to how this looks. There are only a few rules to keep in mind, like the brighter areas where they overlap, like those those sort of the the, the blurring, the the uh, the dimming that happens and the stretching that happens on the sides. Those are all help guide you. But the actual patterns themselves, you can be really creative with it. Uh, and because you you know you look at a photograph or a series of photographs or stills of video, you can see all kinds of things happening with these caustics. Some of them are actually thicker. Some develop a little bit wider. Uh, or you'll have two of them close together and they partially merge, so you get these brighter areas between them. That's fine too. You just got to be creative. I love to try to figure out how light works in the water. Um, it is a fun thing, and that's how you get familiar with how these things work, and that's how you can create the most accurate imagery. Just try to understand optics, and it's it's really neat. Um, so, and and sure, it's just trying to understand the physics yeah. of this. Um, you, you will only see these caustic uh, lines if the animal were close enough yes. to the surface, Good right? Point. You don't see this yes. if they're like 100 meters underwater. Right, and that's the, uh, the other reason for that is because, yeah, they're basically, light is being focused on the surface. But if you go below, you remember how when you use a magnifying glass to focus sunlight, you'll get a point at a certain distance from the magnifying glass where the sun is, is focused. And then you go below that and it blurs out again because it's no longer in focus. The same way with the waves. The waves are just lenses. And so they focus sunlight at a particular distance. Below that, it becomes blurred out. And all you see first is the caustics being just wide swaths of light of color and just being less uh, conspicuous and more obscure. And then the further down you go, the less light there is and the less focused they are even still. and before long at all, all you get is just a uniformly brighter surface on top. Uh, you'll see, actually, speaking of that, you'll see that the vaquita is lighter underneath than on top. It's, it's an actual coloration aside from, from the, the shadows. And that is what we call countershading. Uh, it means that the, the undersurface of the animal is brighter. And the, the, the evolutionary purpose of this, the, the, the way it functions, is that shadows, the, the animal shades itself, right, when light hits it from above. And that makes it, would make it more visible to predators. The counter shading cancels out some of those shadows that it casts on itself. And it basically makes the animal vanish into the background of the ocean so it can evade predators uh, or sneak up on prey. So this is a wonderful example of an animal that displays this really neat uh, feature that is found all over the animal kingdom, this counter shading. It's very effective both on land and in the water, and you see so many animals with lighter bellies, and this is the primary reason that that exists. There is selection pressure. Uh, they survive better, they escape predation better, when they can hide better. It makes sense, right? And, 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 and like you mentioned, uh, that uh, they like to sneak up on prey too, because they are very adorable, they're such <laughs> cute animals, but they're actually yes. really mean predators yes, if they need they to are. be. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are, they're, that's true. And if, you, if it opened its mouth, you could see a vaquita's teeth. Um, like the uh, porpoises have more spoon-shaped teeth than uh, than uh, dolphins, for example. They but don't look like a predator's teeth. They don't look, yeah, exactly. But they're still effective at catching fish, and uh, and and so they function as they are needed to function. They work well in the environment in which they are and for the prey that they need. Um, and uh, so they are predators. They do need to hunt. It's just that they happen to be so adorable. Um, with this little panda-like spot and stuff. I'm putting the eye in now. The eye also of cetaceans is beautiful. I love, I love their eyes. They always have this sort of peaceful look, uh, even you know when they're out killing fish. Uh, <laughs> they still have these beautiful little peaceful eyes. Um, and uh, I, I just, uh, I remember this one, the one time that I had this beautiful experience in Hawaii, actually, when a, a spinner dolphin, um, I was underwater, uh, snorkeling and um, just checking out the coral reef in this beautiful bay area and this spinner dolphin came and swam by to check me out and, oh my god to see to see a marine mammal approach you and just swim by you curiously it's just it's it's just a spectacular experience um, you can't really describe how beautiful it is that a wild animal comes to check you out and I am always amazed at how peaceful they are and gentle with humans. All cetaceans, basically. Um, orcas, the top predators of the ocean, basically. Sperm whales as well. Uh, they are so amazingly peaceful and gentle with us. It's, 
it it it, it's, uh, it seems statistically unlikely that if that it was just by accident. They're they seem to be avoiding harming us, and I I think that's just beautiful example of how large animals that are capable of so much uh, danger or damage choose not to for us. And let's be the same way. Let's let's choose to look out for them, to care for them, to really be concerned about them just because they are, uh -huh. not because they serve I... any purpose for us. Just let's respect them, let's love them and show them that we care by doing what we can to protect them. I love the sentiment that they are so gentle and they don't harm us, so we shouldn't harm them. I mean, you know, let's not approach them to harass them because that's important too, right? Because <laughs> a lot of people will, and unfortunately we did see that's that in right. Hawaii as well. We saw some people chasing dolphins and that's yeah. illegal for one thing, but, um, but it's also harmful and it's, it's, it's good that's illegal because they need, they need to be able to get away and have peace uh, from, you know, people harassing them. Same thing with sharks. We have a lot of people that kind of try to approach sharks and sharks are a lot more gentle than most people realize. But we also don't want to harass them for their good as well as for safety. Um, and, you know, we leave them alone and then we have these wonderful experiences with them. They will often come and check us out. Uh, both dolphins and porpoises, and in, in the case in, I had in Caledon New Caledonia a couple of years ago, sharks as well, they came and checked me out. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful experiences. Uh, and with the vaquita, we need to give them their space, but um, we can do things to protect them from out of the water. So I would really encourage us all to let's be compassionate and empathetic at our core. And let's use that as a yardstick, uh, as a standard of how to live in everything that we do. Uh, whether, you know, we choose, okay, well, I'm gonna, I don't have to buy this particular product, even though I would really enjoy its taste or whatever. But let's say I have a choice between two versions of it. One that's, for example, wrapped in plastic, another one that's not, uh, because, you know, that plastic may be recycled, maybe not but it, it is a threat to marine wildlife, especially. Um, so I'll choose the one that, that is better for them, even if it costs the same or is equally convenient for me, even if it's more convenient for me to buy the one that's less responsibly wrapped or, or sourced, or that tastes good, but comes from a source that maybe is um, removing animals in, a, in an unsustainable way from the environment. I choose not to get those. I choose to give up a little bit of my convenience or, or you know, taste enjoyment because to me it's more important that these animals and their environments do well. I don't even care that I may not see all of the outcome of it. I may not ever see a wild vaquita. Doesn't matter. I do care about them, and so many of us do care about them. We. Thanks to the wonderful photographers out there that have given us pictures to be able to uh, enjoy them from a distance. And people like you who've created, who've recreated stunning. digital, stunning, stunning digital work. imagery. And this to me is, is so enjoyable to be able to do something that I can then apply to helping. To me, this really fuels me. Um, I, I try whatever I can to volunteer uh, for conservation initiatives because especially, and Lauren and Marcus, you guys were saying Pointing out very well, the last couple of years has have been brutal for many people. Um, I tend to be a very introverted person. Uh, pretty much on the autism spectrum, I tend to have a lot more stress with uh, with people in the presence of people uh, physically. So I, I'm okay with being alone. But even in my case, I have found the last couple of years to be really rough in many ways, and I found it impacting my work, even even if it's made little difference in how I how much I see and in, interact with crowds for example it, we need things to recharge us and you know what I found very very few things almost nothing that recharges <laughs> me personally as much as doing things to that I know are impacting positively the biosphere and there are so many things to be able to do that way, from going to the shore to picking up plastic on the on from the shore, for example, before it gets swept into the water. There are fun teams that are organized to do that, to doing these kinds of events where we are reaching out to thousands of people around the world and just encouraging each other to do what we can and that we know can make a difference uh, in this kind of this, this war we're waging against apathy. It's really what it is, is that we're trying to defeat 
those aspects in ourselves and our communities that would would rather look the other way. Um, and, and it is in many ways like a war, uh, but however you look at it, it's wonderfully invigorating to become involved in projects of any size, small or large, or all of them, <laughs> that can make a difference. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't always make a difference. I've found that having this attitude alone and just doing something because you know it's the right thing to do uh, in terms of, of, of sustainability or protecting the biosphere is itself very rewarding. Um, it's, it's, it's just hard to describe it any other way. It's like, let's not wait for somebody else to do the right thing or for enough people to do the right thing for it to make, you know, to, for there to be a tipping point. Let's just do it anyway, right? We know what's right to do. We have a lot of good ideas and we're going to share more about what's right, you know, what things help the environment, uh, both in the package and in the seminars today. But let's just do that. Let's use it. Let's apply those kinds of things and, and do what we can. And that does make a difference. And we've seen time and time again, many examples of where wildlife have benefited from individuals' actions strung together, summed up in a cumulative, larger impact, basically. You can make a difference as an individual, but you can also make a difference as part of a group. Both of those are very important and both of them are highly effective. Julius, I'm curious, as you're drawing this stunning image here, I wanted to show people what I've done. But first of all, I need to ask you, uh, how how long have you been creating art like you're currently doing for us? So, I mean, I've always had an interest in artwork. I've always been a, kind of a hobby artist for a long time in my life. Uh, I started drawing when I was, I guess, like three or something. Uh, but so it's always been interesting to me, but I've really been commercially working as an artist and illustrator since 2005. So I guess that's okay. now been 17 years. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been there. And, um, and I've, I've had the pleasure to work with a large number of, of wonderful researchers, uh, to create press release images for their publications so that it, in, you know, it allows more people to see it in, in news media. Uh, and that that's actually helpful a great deal for researchers to have to make their otherwise less easily accessible research visible to a larger community. Yeah. But also with uh, groups of museum uh, curators and exhibit designers to make huge life sized paintings of dinosaurs and prehistoric sharks and all kinds of wonderful animals. Uh, and plants, uh, life-size forests from the Carboniferous period, for example, in the Smithsonian's. Well, you uh, posted a video of drawing ferns yes, in a Carboniferous right. image. Mm -hmm. I think you were using that tablet, and it was really cool because you had zoomed in and you were showing the detail work of this fern, and it was yeah. mesmer. I mean, watching you draw is mesmerizing. That's why I think it's so funny. If anyone's interested, if you are drawing yeah, along with us, mm -hmm. um, as Julius is drawing his vaquita. I downloaded an app. Oh, I don't know if you can oh, see excellent. it. That took me nine minutes, <laughs> but it's actually a really cool app. Oh, that's great. Thank that's you. Awesome. Oh, you're too really kind. Nice. <laughs> but no, it's it's as uh, Julius is kind of zooming in and editing this little app on my phone uh, allowed me to do that as very well. Cool. So I'm feeling very see? accomplished. Just and like we're that. Put that away. <laughs> in, in minutes, you can create artwork um, by downloading apps and then interacting with it on your phone and allowing your creativity to kind of show itself that way. That is really cool. See, that's that's the kind of thing you can do. It's super easy. Uh, there's so much technology out there now to allow us to do this. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and you can use it in so many fun ways. And it's okay that it takes time to do. It makes me think of a word I learned uh, from, from the Squamish Nation. It's uh, Tima Quetzi. Mm -hmm. And it means it takes as long as it takes. Uh, yes. And I've been using it with students. I've been using it for lots of people because I think we do put that pressure on ourselves that yes. something has to happen right now. And... Uh, Julius is going to continue to work on this beautiful piece of art um, throughout the afternoon, so we'll be able to go back and show that to you. Um, but I think we need to be a bit more gentle with ourselves and know that this Great. is a big topic that we're talking about. We're talking about a species disappearing forever, which is a horrifying, heartbreaking, yes. utterly devastating thing to be thinking about. Um there's a lot of people who have been working on this problem for a long time. There's a lot of people who are still working on it. We're talking to them today. Um, but sometimes when it does feel like things are overwhelming, I think it is helpful for myself to remind myself that sometimes it takes as long as it takes. Tima Quetzi, it, we have to be able to be 
gentle with ourselves in the process and the time it takes to to accomplish the things that we've been talking about here today. So, so um, yeah, I think making it as beautiful as we can while we're on this journey is a big part. So this is this Absolutely. is really exciting. And and uh, sort of a corollary to that as well is that we have community. You're not alone. Uh, we feel despair a lot, right? Uh, when we see what's happening to the biosphere in many ways, including the vaquita. But remember that you're not alone. There are thousands of people, all of us, working separately and sometimes together in groups in many ways, working on these problems. And it is being done. And these people are very approachable. Network, make friends online, in person and so on with these communities. It's wonderful to be able to reach out to people who think the same way. It is so empowering and so gives you so much relief of the and respite from the despair. I really encourage you to do that because it does help an enormous amount. Uh, these days, uh, something that's becoming a very large, much larger sector of psychology is this, this concept of uh, ecological grief or uh, climate despair, uh, people suffering a great deal from seeing the way that the biosphere is, is taking a hit from our activities. Uh, and, and it's something that's being talked about a lot more in psychological circles uh, in, in education, uh, in, in, in treatment uh, of it as well. And a lot of the times, what, one of the things that's being recommended, of course, is to, to take action, to, to, to get involved with others uh, in these kinds of initiatives that help to right the problem. Because A, it helps you to feel better about doing something, and B, it actually does address the problem and makes it better. So regardless, you don't have to solve the whole thing. You don't need to put all of it on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Doing a little bit makes a difference. And yep. that's all you need to do. If everybody does that, we could make a huge difference in the world. Uh, and so that's that's the best way about it for treating the problem both in, a, in, the, in the world out at large and within our, ourselves, our minds that are, are so heavy these days from so much of this, uh, this trouble that, that we're experiencing. When you know you mentioned at the beginning, uh, it feels like a drop in the bucket, but you know, after a while, those drops can fill the bucket. Absolutely. And we've got another drop here that we're going to be adding Excellent. to our bucket. Um, Julius is going to continue to draw. He's going to continue to add to his uh, very beautiful piece of art here. 